Welcome fellow ecologists. In chapter 18, we'll be exploring primary production and energy flow. Most of you are familiar with the idea that energy flows through ecosystems while materials cycle around in the ecosystems. And in this chapter, we'll be exploring the flow of energy through with a focus on primary production. We start out the section by talking about primary production in a terrestrial or land environment and then we'll move into the aquatic environment and see how primary production is influenced there and how consumers tend to drive this production and then we'll look at the different trophic levels and how they interact with each other in order to determine the level of production in these different systems. When we consider the primary producers in an ecosystem, talking about plants here, we consider the primary production as the amount of energy that they can actually grab through the process of photosynthesis. So in this process, they're taking the sun's energy and transforming it into chemical energy by bringing carbon together with oxygen and, and hydrogen and making a sugar molecule. That rate at which they do that is the rate of primary production. But not all of this energy is available to other organisms in the system. And that leads to the idea of the net primary production, which is actually the amount of energy that's left over after these plants go through the process of cellular respiration and other metabolic needs that they might have. In ecosystems, there are a variety of different feeding levels that allow energy to be transferred from the producers into the various levels of consumers. And we call those feeding levels trophic levels. Troph means to feed. And we have at the beginning of these, the primary producers, which are the plants that grab the energy from sunlight and convert it into chemical energy, like sugar, and then it's passed on to other organisms in the ecosystem by those organisms feeding on each other. So the herbivores feed on the plants, they would be the primary consumers, and then the carnivores who feed on the herbivores would be the secondary consumers, or the third trophic level. And then those organisms that feed on carnivores would then be the fourth level. And this can go on. Usually a terrestrial ecosystem has less levels than an aquatic ecosystem. When we think about the patterns of terrestrial primary production, one of the things that pops out right away is that the more moisture there is and the warmer it is, the more production there's going to be. You think of a tropical rainforest and the amount of production that's occurring there. Rosenzweig uh, quantified this idea by measuring the annual e evaporation and transpiration from uh, the land. And you think in terms of transpiration is the the water that's actually going through the plants and and then leaving through the leaves and that really gives you an idea of how much water is available and he found of course that in areas where it's cold and dry that production levels are lower and the AET or annual actual evapotranspiration rate is lower there Figure 18.2 points out this relationship between net primary production and AET. You can see um, the different types of terrestrial environments that occur along that line, and it's a positive relationship with increasing AET, you have increasing net primary production. Sela found the same positive relationship when he looked at the production associated with grasslands from the Mississippi west to New Mexico and he saw that there was greater rainfall 
along the Mississippi and the eastern areas than in the west and that's the way the production went as well and that's exemplified in figure 18.3. Another component that helps to explain the distribution of primary production differences across land environments is soil fertility. And certainly as farmers have known for years, lands that have more nitrogen and phosphorus in them are going to pro uh, produce more crops. And so both Schaefer, Schaefer and Chapman and the Bowman studies demonstrated this very clearly. Similarly, in an aquatic environment, the amount of nutrient, particularly phosphorus, that is in the system affects the level of production. And we've seen this extensively in freshwater lakes and streams in this part of Wisconsin, where runoff from of fertilizer from farms or from lawns has caused serious problems of excess vegetation in our lakes and streams. We see a similar pattern occurring in oceans around the world where the nutrient runoff from the continents uh, causes the algae in these systems, near shore systems, to increase dramatically. So we end up with very productive waters near the continents. And this is demonstrated in figure 18.9 where the, the bright red colors reflect the high level of production and the blue color, the light blue, indicates a low level of production. And you can see that most of the production is occurring near the continents. In a study in the Baltic Sea, Grinelli was able to demonstrate that nitrogen was the key factor that was really limiting the production in that system. And that's particularly important because one of the main uh, components of human waste is nitrogen. So as these areas become more and more populated, then the, the runoff from these areas or any coastal area will have a huge impact on the primary production in these coastal regions. In the analysis of the data of some of these marine primary production studies, Dillon and Brigler realized that not all of the variation was explained by the different levels of nutrients and that there must be something else going on here. And so they looked at the impact of predation on this system. And that opened up a whole nother area of investigation for these aquatic systems. So this really leads to the exciting part of this chapter for me, and that's because what we end up with are two really valuable tools that resource managers can use in order to influence ecosystems. The bottom-up control and the top-down control where the bottom-up control, you perhaps limit the amount of nutrient that gets into a system. Or you look at some of the other physical factors that are influencing that ecosystem. In the top-down control, maybe you change the, the level of predation by increasing predators, like stocking fish in a lake or bringing in wolves into a system where there are too many deer. So these types of bottom-up and top-down controls can be used by resource managers to really have an impact on the system that they're working on. The idea that consumers could really have an impact on the primary production rate was very clearly demonstrated by the work that was done by Carpenter and Kitchell and their idea of the trophic cascade hypothesis. In this idea, they're, they're looking at how top-level predators can have an effect on lower-level predators, and then that can impact levels below that. So it's kind of a cascade. And you can see this in figure 1811 in your book, where the 
the top level carnivore there, which looks like a largemouth bass, is feeding on planktivorous fish. And the more that it would reduce the planktivorous fish, the less those would feed on the zooplankton, which in turn would have an impact on the phytoplankton. So if there's less zooplankton, then there would be more phytoplankton and so on. So this trophic cascade then has an impact on the actual primary production based on the consumption that's occurring at these upper levels. If you look at figure 1812, you can get an idea of what increased levels of a fish like the largemouth bass, a piscivore, fish-eating fish, could have on the system. Now in each of these graphs, production is the greatest at an intermediate level of the piscivore. And so what we see is that as the piscivore increases in biomass, this decreases the number of planktivorous fish, the graph on the left, and as that number goes down, then the, the number of zooplankton are going to increase. With the increasing number of zooplankton, then in the third graph on the right, you can see that there'd be a reduction in their food, which is the phytoplankton. So the phytoplankton are the primary producers, so they would actually decrease. And as that happens, the level of overall production declines. So you can see how just the, the number of largemouth bass in the system really has an impact on the overall primary production. The impact of consumers is also seen in the terrestrial environment in studies that were done on the Serengeti in Africa. Here McNaught found that the Serengeti grazers, the wildebeest, were really taking an average of about 66 percent of the of the annual primary production and that certainly this production was positively impacted by the rainfall but they also found that it was very positively affected by grazing it was found that grazing actually increases primary production because the grass has a compensatory growth mechanism that with a moderate level of grazing it increases the total biomass because it reduces the amount of, of respiration because there's less actual uh, leaf area of the plant and it also reduces the self-shading so you can get more plants growing next to each other and then they're losing less water because of the reduced leaf area. So if the grazing is too light then it doesn't start this compensatory growth process but if it's too heavy it actually reduces the the plants so much that they don't have the ability to recover after grazing and so they don't grow back. So that intermediate level of grazing is just ideal in order to maintain the greatest level of primary production. So what we can learn from these studies is that the evaluation of the flow of energy through terrestrial systems and aquatic systems is best assessed by considering all the different components of the ecosystem and looking at primary production and the different levels of consumers. What we end up with is the idea that energy is lost as there's a transfer from one trophic level to another. And the rule of thumb is that about 90% of that energy is lost from trophic level to trophic level because of the, the limited assimilation of energy, the, the fact that there's cellular respiration going on at each level, and heat production is happening at the various levels, so that you really end up with this pyramid where there's 
a lot more energy or biomass on the base of the pyramid, which are the primary producers. And then as you move up from trophic level to trophic level, there's less and less energy. So you end up with this energy pyramid, or it could be a biomass pyramid, or even a pyramid made up of numbers of organisms. But in all cases, it has this, this shape of reducing energy as you move up the different trophic levels. I'd like to end this chapter then with figure 18.7. I don't expect you to memorize the detail of this at all, but I just want you to walk through it carefully and notice that the solar radiation coming in is way, way more than is actually utilized. You look at all that's reflected and what goes off as heat, and in the end, you only get a net primary production which captures 1% of that total solar radiation that was coming into the system. And then you see what happens to that 1% as it's distributed throughout the, the different ecosystems, including the stream. So that gives you an idea of the complexity and the tremendous amount of energy that's coming to this planet from the sun that really isn't used in many of our systems.